Love podcast, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Show podcast. <laughs> uh, today we are joined, as always, by Ava Santina and special gl- and special guest SNP MP Mary Black. Thank Hi-ya. you, for coming. How did you feel about that intro? Uh, it's the best I've heard. To be honest, <laughs> the best I've had. You're you firmly anti nonce. Anti nonce. I'm. I, I, th- I think that's a pretty standard position. Don't well, you, you don't know. Mind you, know the full gallop. Maybe yeah. <laughs> Just, well, Politics Joe exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I like that you choked over special guests. You couldn't get it out. You were like, oh, this has been written down. I've got to say it. I've got to say special guests. No, that was, off, that was off the dome, and uh, I'm not good, at, not good at that. We're here to react to today's uh, PMQs, so let's jump in. Mr Speaker, his party spent thousands of pounds on adverts attacking plans to build 300,000 new homes a year. At the same time, his housing minister says it's Tory party policy to build 300,000 new homes a year. So is he for building 300,000 new homes a year or against it? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I can just remind the honourable gentleman of our record uh, since being in office. 2.2 million additional homes, Mr Speaker. Housing starts double the number we inherited from the Labour Party, more homes meeting the decent home standards, housing supply up 10% in the last year that we have figures for, and in in the last year we had figures for, we also saw a 20-year high in the number of first-time buyers, Mr Speaker. That's a Conservative government delivering for this country. Mr Speaker, it wasn't a difficult question. Um, So, can he point... To a single person in housing, in construction, anywhere, who thinks he'll actually hit his target of 300,000 new homes a year. Anyone? Oh, anyone. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, the record is that in the last three years, we've delivered almost record numbers of new home building in every one of those years. Do we think Sunak is doing enough on housing? <laughs> That's a silly question, isn't it, really? Sorry. <laughs> Let's actually talk about, no, no, no. I meant like, I mean, it's a good question that you've said. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Um, Thank you. No, look, I mean, OK, so this, Keir Starmer's talking about the targets that haven't been reached. Um, Rishi Sunak and the, well, actually, it was Boris Johnson's administration that promised there'd be at least 280,000 homes built every single year for the past five years. They've missed that target every single year. So that's what Keir Starmer was trying to point out today. Sunak refused to admit that was the case. Yeah. See, it's, it's interesting because usually Keir Starmer could bore you to tears. When, <laughs> when, when it, it takes, uh, like, because he's got six questions, it's almost as though he, he wants to take the scenic route through yeah, yeah, yeah. before mm. he asks a question. But this week I actually thought it was one of his better sessions. Mm. I think he's getting, he's kind of changing his tact a little bit. Like, I think mm-hmm. the last couple, he has gone straight in with, like, a quick-fire question. Mm-hmm. And I think he's trying to prove that Sunak refuses to answer anything yeah. that's leveraged at him. Mm-hmm. But actually, personally, as the viewer, I find it quite boring. Yeah, <laughs> I, suppose totally. that, I suppose that ultimately it's not for the viewer. I think that's like maybe... This is not a spectacle. I don't know what you <laughs> mean. Like, <this laughs> no, but, I th- but I think taking, it's taking the scenic route. I don't know, it's more poetic. It's what they do in like the, you know, the 19th century. But it's rubbish though. <laughs> no, it is, like, no, it is Even it is in the chamber, it's like, gee, God, just get to the point. <laughs> like, we all want to ask something, just hurry up. You know, it's you get six questions. Stop hogging it. Yeah, <laughs> be, basically. It'd be boring. Because even like today, I was thinking why, like he's right to go on housing and everything, but he, he should have flipped it and and that he's saying, look, is it not the case that the Tories aren't building houses because nobody can afford to live in them? Mm. Like mm. It, tie the two things together, but he, he never seems to do what seems obvious to yeah. to us. And like a great point would be about, you know, are you refusing to build houses because you're trying to protect, you know, supply mm-hmm. for landlords? You yeah, could really exactly. like get in on that. Exactly. But I mean what's what's your housing policy looking like at the moment? I mean we're in like, you know, a state of yeah. mortgage disarray. But where are you on all that? So I mean like the SNP they've always they've got a good track record when it comes to house building. Um the the main thing that we did was uh, stop the the sale of uh, council housing mm. because that's one of the chronic issues is folk just can't get a house because they've all been bought up mm. and they're all being let out by usually not great landlords. Mm. Um, so I think that was a, a major step in a different direction, certainly in Scotland. So it's still the problems are there. You know, everybody's mortgages are going up, everybody's rents are going up, and that's where it's firmly at Westminster's door. What are you <laughs> no. doing in Glasgow? Because that was a big issue at one point, but mm-hmm. that's kind of like 
curtailed off a little bit is that just like a student surge because the issue was kind of around september when no one could get a house oh, mm-hmm. at Glasgow Uni. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that more under control now or like it, as far as i'm aware i've not heard anything about yeah. it yeah no one's there <laughs> <laughs> everyone's gone yeah. Yeah. no but you're right i mean it's extraordinary i live in a house that's a i think most people do in big cities ex-council houses that mm-hmm. are now being let out by landlords yeah absolutely extraordinary that that's allowed to happen See, when you're sitting at Prime Minister's Questions as the SNP, obviously the SNP are in power in Scotland, Mm -hmm. but not in Westminster, obviously. But what are you thinking about as a party or as a unit? Are you thinking just purely as opposition to Westminster? Or are you also thinking about the Scottish government when it comes to approaching questions, when Mm -hmm. it comes to holding? Yeah, no, there's there's definitely, I I think, a bit of both, um, to tell you the truth, because... I was actually, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, how in Westminster, like, British politics has moved so far to the right that what is considered centre mm. is, to me, is still right wing. Like, mm. It's not actually centrism. Um, so in that sense, f- from where we're at, it's, it's kind of easier to oppose in Westminster because for me the lines are so much clearer. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I don't support that. I fundamentally am against that. Um, and the difficulty then is, of course, when you're up the road in Scotland and government, it's trying to strike the balance between making life better for folk where you can, but also recognising that Scottish Parliament hasn't got the, the powers to really transform things. Um, so, yeah, no, it's a bit of, a, bit of a balancing act. Do you think it's changed a little bit, or like your approach to any to Westminster has changed a little bit since Rishi Sunak tried to what successfully vetoed one of your mm-hmm. one of your laws that you were trying to put through? Do you yep. think like that kind of monumental moment when that power was first used? Mm-hmm. Do you think that's kind of changed how you approach everything? No, actually, because in many respects, it proves it's right. Right, you know, and that it it doesn't feel good because it's it's horrible things that are happening, <laughs> um, but. Like we've always said, particularly when the Internal Market Act came on, well, like, this is riding a like a coaching horses right through devolution. This is just taking a bulldozer, uh, everything that we've spent the last 20, 30 years building. Mm. Um, so it, it it wasn't a surprise to us <laughs> when they start using it. And if anything, it actually just shows how this union functions. It, for all the talk that we've got, you know, the most powerful devolved parliament in the world with the flick of a pen, a prime minister that nobody in Scotland voted for can undo that, um, yeah. which is just ridiculous. Like, how can you claim to be defending democracy and devolution when you're literally legislating a back door to just dismantle everything? And so. certainly when the money levers are being pulled in Westminster mm-hmm. as well, that is like, you're, you're basically at the disposal of Westminster. Yep. So. absolutely. Absolutely, because it, that's fundamentally why I'm, I support independence, because I just think politics is unpredictable and life is unpredictable. That's why it's important that you get governments you vote for, mm. because more importantly, when they don't deliver, you can get shot at them. You know, Scotland's not voted Conservative since 1955, and yet for the vast majority of folks' lifetimes, they've had a Conservative government. How is that democratic mm. <laughs> in any shape or form? Mm. Uh, and it's something that, certainly unionists still can't answer. Mr Speaker, on Sunday the Prime Minister patronised the public when he told them that in the face of ever-increasing mortgage bills that they simply need to hold their nerve. What a nerve. So may I ask him, the near billionaire, when was the last time that he struggled to pay a bill? Mr Speaker, The reason that mortgage rates are rising is because of inflation, Mr Speaker. That is the root cause, which is why it's absolutely the right policy to tackle halve inflation and reduce it back to target. Now, that does mean that we do have to make difficult decisions. It does mean we have to be patient while the impact of those decisions actually has an impact. But in the meantime, Mr Speaker, as I was explaining previously, we are taking practical steps to support mortgage holders across the United Kingdom, particularly through the SMI scheme and the new mortgage charter. When do we think the last time was that Richie Smack uh, couldn't pay a bill? 
<laughs> this is a man who had to get shown how to use a contactless car. Oh, yeah. Right? You think he's staying his bills? Uh, yeah. The one thing we know about him is that he loves his Peloton. He's like, do you remember that, that mug that everyone made a fuss of? The it, heated mug. It was like a 150 pound mug. Yeah. Just kidding. I've never started. Yeah, it keeps the tea hot. Was, this was like two or three years ago. This was like <laughs> when everyone was just learning about Rishi Sunak. For all I slag him, I'm kind of into that. Yeah. <laughs> like, keeping it hot for the whole day? Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, because apparently he's like quite a slow drinker of it or something like that. So he likes to. I think it's kind of slow drinker. Yeah, really. <laughs> I don't know. Just having one cup, of, like kind of congeals. What would you? What's going on with your hot drinks? Like, what would you milk. mean? It's congealing like, in there. Skin it's like fermenting within an if hour. You leave, if you leave a cup of tea, it ferments. If the milk's old, maybe. Fair. I don't really drink tea very often, so maybe. I <laughs> it actually, shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually really miss the whole like. This is nice to kind of see Stephen Finn talking about this again because we've sort of forgotten that this is the Prime Minister who changed the entire water table so mm-hmm. that he could yep. heat his pool. Sorry, the national grid, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely extraordinary. Yep. Didn't he also have trouble filling up his car with petrol? Wasn't that another so thing? So he, he had to be had? shown to do No, no, it was he was using someone else's car. Oh yeah. Remember, it, was a, it was just like a normal was it a Volkswagen or something like that. Yeah. They had to borrow. <laughs> and you had to open the petrol thing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so. You can use this Tesla or Bentley or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I was talking to uh, my pal about this recently, how the the sign of true wealth, like real proper billionaire stuff, is you don't wear a jacket because you're constantly <laughs> oh. being like chauffeured about places, That's into right. one building, out there. you don't need to think about it. I've never it. thought about Private it Private like planes, everything. That's like it's succession. Uh, in, yeah, succession. They, they, they never record yep. in succession. Absolutely. Like, shirt, like New York in the winter. Yeah, yeah. Shirts rolled up. Yep. That's straight into the car. And I think Rishi Sunak falls into that That's category. That's so interesting, because that reminds me of a theory that me and my friend had when we were at uni. Like, mm-hmm. people used to turn up to le- uh, lectures or seminars or whatever, and they'd be dressed in, like, like dirty you know, jogging bottoms mm-hmm. or like, you know, just looking filthy, like they just got out of bed. Yeah. And then we turn up looking like prim and proper, like we looked mm-hmm. showered and already. And we were like, this is what actual rich people do. Uh-huh. So they just turn up looking in absolute state <laughs> right. and they don't care. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they don't have to. It's probably because it's... they were getting Ubers to the, <laughs> to the seminar hall. Yeah. That's what it was. Maybe. When Stephen Flynn is preparing for PMQs, he's, always, he's quite a different figure from Ian Blackford. Mm-hmm. Ian Blackford. His questions went on a bit. Oh. <laughs> Famously, yeah. I think it's fair to say. So, wh- how would you describe or how would you compare the two's like attitudes to, to Prime Minister's questions? So, well, I, I'm I'm a big fan of Stephen's style, um, just because. Kind of what I said earlier is it's very to the point. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm, I'm not messing about. We're talking about folks' lives here, and for all that, like one of my criticisms of Westminster is that it's. It's a bubble into itself, like it, it's got its own culture and its own traditions and all the rest of it. And it's like when you step into that chamber, it's a theatre and everybody is there to perform. Mm. And a lot of the time it shows and what works in the chamber, in the room, doesn't necessarily like ha- strike a note with the public. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So for me, Stephen's kind of similar to myself, I think, where he's just... I've got something to say and you're going to listen to that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's it. And even today, actually, his question, sometimes it's you can tie yourself in knots trying to find an angle that nobody else has found or ask something they won't expect. Sometimes you just need to ask the straightforward stuff. Like, it, it, it's not difficult. We've got a billionaire prime minister telling other folk to hold their nerve. You know, you're just yeah. going to have to mm. suck it up and not get a pay rise and you're just going to have to accept that food prices are through the roof, that you can't afford your rent, that you just need to suck it up. What does this guy know about anything? <laughs> like, what does he know about real life? And yet he's the one making decisions. Well, so he that, knows how to conserve a cup of tea. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the height of it. Maybe we should be listening to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> there has been quite like a, a more obvious, I think, split or faction between you and the Labour Party, mm-hmm. over the lo- particularly over the last couple of months. I think it was more subtle at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. And now you're kind of out and out going, you know, talking about how Sir Keir Starmer has not got the mm-hmm. interests of working class people in his, you know, any of his pledges or any of yep. his policies. I mean, how is that split looking? What, what is it, actually, do you know what? Is there anything that you agree on <laughs> at the moment, would you say? Eh, uh, <laughs> or distaste for Tories. <laughs> Yes. This is probably about it. Because th- th- this is kind of my, my problem with the, the Labour Party, particularly under Sir Keir, uh, is 
the, don't call him Keith. That's the only one you <laughs> can't call don't him. Don't call him Keith. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it's because when you look at the big issues, Labour are in the same place as the Tories. You mm. know, uh, when it comes to u-turns when it comes to cuts when it comes to austerity when it comes to immigration when it comes to brexit when it comes to devolution and how they're going to respond to the scottish parliament they're all ex they're the same they're, they're singing for the same hymn sheet and you know the irony to hear labor and particularly starmer talking about you know people want change people want change what are you going to change mm. like it, so far the pitch seems to be we won't be them, like, and that's it. It's just oh, we're going to keep doing the same things, but just a, a bit better. Like that's not mm. what people need just now. They need radical, radical change. They need this entire system to change how it deals with ordinary people because the other ones are yeah. suffering. Because it's a risky move as well, isn't it? I mean, breaking away from the other large opposition. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, if you're not kind of acting in coalition, yeah. it's very difficult to block any Tory bills that might to be going fair, through. To be fair though, the offer of working together, certainly in my experience, has always been there from the SNP. Right. It's Labour that go, oh, we don't want anything to do with you. No, no. And, and I mean, that's a fair choice, but I don't think it does them any good at all because when you're facing the kind of governments that we've seen over the last decade, we should be united on a lot of things, you know, for being the official opposition, they don't do a lot of opposing. Mm. Um, and that's been our biggest gripe with them, is it often feels like we're a better opposition than they are because the, the number of times they've abstained or voted with the Tories on things is shameful. Yeah, Absolutely shameful. I think abstaining is probably one of the most egregious things that you can do in Parliament, for me personally, because mm -hmm. I just think that's just that's just like being nothing. It's yeah. like, you know, I like have an opinion Aye. on the bill. Like, see, because this also kind of frustrates me as well with how Parliament actually functions, because like, see, even see if my flight's cancelled and I can't make a vote, I, I get put down as abstained, mm. you know, or if someone's ill, that can be a abstained and then equally other times it's a totally principled thing where they're going right I'm I'm not supporting that um so that, like there's different there's nuance uh, in terms of how you read votes but fundamentally yeah I what think on the big stuff there was in case there. anyone goes to check your voting record <laughs> you made <laughs> you laid it down I was on a flight <laughs> it was principled yeah. I'm saying this it happened about two weeks ago oh, really, oh, really? <laughs> I missed the vote because uh, the BA flight get cancelled but yeah name them name them <laughs> <laughs> sort your app out as well uh, it's they're chronic. halting democracy. <laughs> Get married, that self-eating mug. <laughs> <laughs> and the black card for BA. Uh, I just wanted to touch on there. You mentioned, we were talking just, just there about, um, you noticed like a, a more heat towards the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Is that in tandem, I'm going to be cynical, is that in tandem with a resurgence in the polls for Labour in Scotland? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, kind of, because... Uh, I th in my experience, and even when I'm chatting doors just now, folk aren't voting Labour because they believe in Labour. It's because they're so sick of the Tories. And to me, I, I, like Labour should be running away with it just now, considering not just the horrific policies, but also the incompetence of consecutive Prime Ministers and consecutive Tory governments. Um, so... I understand that what drives folk uh, certainly seems to in the upcoming election is just basically anti-Tory. Mm. And that's where I think it's important for us to highlight to folks that, well, if it's anti-Tory that you're wanting and anti-everything the Tories stand for, you should be aware that they're not that different right now. Yeah. Like, and again, as I say, if you're wanting radical change, Starmer's no offering it. So it's... A balancing act again, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's quite right to point out Labour's failures and where we're stepping into a space that they should be occupying, frankly. I'm always hesitant when MPs talk about what they hear on the doorstep because that could be anything, do you know what I mean? Uh, like, you know, like it, it <laughs> yeah. just kind of fits in. But no, the MRP polling, like the recent polling that's the most accurate polling mm -hmm. would suggest that that is exactly where people are turning yep. to Labour. It's just, it's just against Tories. There's mm -hmm. no particular policy that people are picking yeah. up on with. Well, if, even if there was, it would be abandoned the next day. Oh, that, oh, this is oh, the other thing. That wasn't even like... <laughs> uh, sorry, that's true. It's, 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 yep. 
absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, the green stuff that they, uh, the, the incredible... Rent, rent control like, today. Yeah, right. rent controls, I know. But no, no, but, today. <laughs> so, public sector, oh, yeah. as well. Just well, I like that they keep doing over, like, the quite good shadow front benches. Like, Ed Miliband <laughs> had that, like, entire climate change briefing. Yeah. He was so excited about it. And yeah. then they completely just and blow it out And he was good at it as well. He, he was. was. We really don't fix anything. And then Lisa Nandy's just out there trying to get rent controls in towns because that's what she likes. <laughs> oh, <God, Townsville. laughs> every city again. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Should we do another clip? Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister has had responsibility for the UK economy now for 1,323 days and he's delivered. He's delivered the largest national peacetime debt ever, the largest tax burden since the Second World War. Yeah. The highest core inflation since 1991, the fastest interest rate rises since 1989, and the biggest fall in living standards in our history. So, will he stop lecturing my constituents about holding their nerve, ditch the lame excuses, and admit that he is literally the worst person to be leading this country through a cost of living crisis? Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, again, for, what do we hear from the party opposite? O only ideas that would make the situation far worse, Mr. Speaker. It's as simple as that. The honourable gentleman has sat there and supported plans to borrow tens of billions of pounds more. That would make inflation worse. The honourable gentleman has sat there and said that we should not stand up to unaffordable union pay demands. That would make the situation worse. And the honourable gentleman has sat there and supported plans to not exploit our domestic sources of energy, Mr. Speaker, imperiling our energy security. Those are all things that would make not just the situation worse for British families today, but for years into the future, and that's why this Conservative government will keep doing the right thing to support them. Is Rishi Sunak good at the economy? No. <laughs> Great. Next. <laughs> cool. uh, it's quite strong from Chris Bryan, isn't it? I suppose he's it... raging. He looked like fu furious. Yeah. I mean, he does also, he does know to get the clip. He does yeah. know that. There has been yeah, a... He's a good performer. Yes. Yeah. There's, 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 there's MPs who we kind of think are like, oh, you're doing this for yeah. you're doing this for the clip. For the clip. It's when, it's when like MPs get like kicked it, out. They do. Yeah. It's <laughs> great. That, that's <laughs> the logic. <laughs> uh -huh. The DMs. The DMs after like anyone has like oh, been yeah. speaking and you get like a clip being I've just spoken in Parliament. You go to watch it and you're like, oh, why are you why are you crying? <laughs> she, <laughs> like, <laughs> see what I find so cringy and I mean I've, I've sometimes been guilty of it myself is see any politician after they speak, you'll see them, they go on their phone and what they're doing is looking up like, is anybody talking about me? No. Nice. Did, did anybody nice. see it? What's the response? Like, <laughs> yeah. just sitting googling themselves, like, <laughs> over your shoulder. Okay. That's, that's why you're doing it. That's why you're MP for the Twitter numbers. Yes. Twitter Maybe that's right. what Neil Parrish was doing. Could <laughs> <laughs> be a better excuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's that video I've been myself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, th I think what Chris Bryant is doing is it's good to remember that Rishi Sunak isn't just a new prime minister who's only been present since yeah. when was that no october november mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he was part of boris johnson's government yep. for co since just before covid yeah and has overseen overseen just a dreadful economy he's been a fundamental part of the last 10 years mm -hmm. yeah definitely I am always fascinated by whenever we talk about the economy and we, we, we just we, we kind of just trace it back to Liz Truss and we just say like, well, if she hadn't tanked yeah. the economy, we wouldn't be in this issue. And it's like every single like moment from the past 12 years, at least, if not, you know, probably actually more like mm -hmm. 2005 has just been leading up to this moment. There's been wage stagnation. Yep. Automation has been introduced into the economy. Globalization. Yep. Nothing has been done to expand the UK's economy or look at growth. And suddenly mm -hmm. we're like, <laughs> what's going on? Yep. <laughs> but uh, th this is also, again, where I am astounded that neither the Tories or Labour want to talk about Brexit. Because mm. yeah. there are... Like, it's staring everybody right in the face that Brexit is a big part of why things are so shit just now. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's, there's no other way to put it. And until we start wrestling with that, then it's, it's, we're, we're on a decline and it doesn't show any sign of slowing. But you've got an easy way out. 
Mm -hmm. Because in Scotland, you can just say, like, you know, yeah, we didn't want that. <laughs> yeah, that's going really, that's that's going really well. That's how we are. Africa and Scotland are currently independent. No, that's not what I meant. I meant your argument yeah. for Brexit is just that, you know, we didn't want this. And also it's like been, you know, mm -hmm. extremely harmful to the economy. Yep. And this is Westminster again, dictating how it all works up mm -hmm. here. But if you are... Keir Starmer, mm -hmm. and you're trying to win back the, I hate this phrase, but the quote-unquote yeah. red wall. Mm -hmm. yep. what, what do you actually say? Well, it, but that's where, again, my, my criticism of Westminster politics and how it affects politics in England as a whole is uh, it's, in recent years anyway, everything's been fought on slogans and, uh, you know, just what's snappy, what looks good, what, mm. like that, what, the clips, all the rest of it. And that's, that's fine, but behind all that, you've got to have honest conversations with people and you've got to be, you can't treat folk like idiots. Mm -hmm. Like it, This idea that, you know, your ordinary punter doesn't understand the economy, like, of course, you, there's experts everywhere, but on the whole, it's pretty straightforward. Like, folk will understand if you can explain and talk them through why you think what you think. And part of what the problem was in the 2016 Brexit referendum was just so much disinformation just getting flung out there. And there's never been a sort of reckoning about that. There's mm. never been an ownership of you were lied to. And it, it's not just a case of it was a bad idea in the first place, but the evidence is there that this is making things worse. So we need to revisit it. And when it comes to folk who voted for Brexit, I think it's also about trying to understand why they voted for Brexit. Because a lot of it was driven, in my view, was driven by racist dog whistles. It was all anti-immigration. Well, you're, being part of the EU is much more than just talking about immigration. Like, this is our trade. This is our international global partnerships. Why would you want to distance yourself from that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Well, the problem is, though, is that because it's so steeped in ideology, that's, mm -hmm. that's the, well, actually, it's very prevalent to the clip we're about to talk about because it's now happening with the trans movement. Mm -hmm. It's becoming this sort of, this idea that is so hyperbolized and hyped up that it's actually kind of bigger than us. Mm -hmm. There's no sort of rational discussion mm -hmm. of Brexit and there's no rational discussion of trans, so. Yep. Rule clip. Mm. Following the 10 minute rule bill of the member for North West Leicestershire this afternoon, a number of right honourable and honourable members of this House have been accused of being in support of grooming children. I've looked on the Metropolitan Police's website, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's very specific that grooming is when a person builds a relationship with a child, young person or an adult who's at risk so they can abuse them and manipulate them into doing things. The abuse is usually sexual. That accusation, Mr Deputy Speaker, has been retweeted by the member for North West Leicestershire, and I seek the House and indeed your advice as to what action members can take to ensure that there is some sort of sanction on that, I believe, unparliamentary behaviour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that point of order? Sir Chris? Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't want to comment on whether there's an appropriate sanction because I'm chair of the Committee on Standards, but the tweet that is referred to says that um, several Conservative members voted against the motion and in support of the grooming and mutilation of children. Oh. Now, I think that that is incitement. Yeah. It is incitement, I would suggest, towards violence against Conservative members and members of this side who voted against the motion today. Um, I think it's probably also actionable, yeah. and if any of the honourable members on the Conservative side want to pursue that course of action, I would stand with them. And donate. Do you want to explain the bill, Ava, that they're actually talking about, if you can? The b yeah, bloody hell. You could, have <laughs> <laughs> you could have let me know. I can't, so you're going to do it. Um, yeah, so it was an opposition day debate yesterday, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and it was Andrew Bridgen was... <laughs> fuck. Live fact-checking. <laughs> fuck. Uh. Um, Andrew Bridgen was presenting his uh, new gender and parental rights bill. Essentially, Andrew Bridgen has crossed over and he's no longer a Conservative MP. He's now with Lawrence Fox's Reclaim Party. And part of being in that is the main point seemed to be anti-COVID lockdown, anti-trans, <coughs> uh, um, and well, well an anti-woke. That's the yeah, other one, isn't generally it? Generally anti-wokeism. And so this bill was basically arguing that teachers should be allowed to out children who have said that they might have some kind of 
con uh, questions over their gender mm -hmm. or how they're, you know, they might be experiencing gender dysphoria. Um, and then in result to that, MPs were allowed to vote on it and it was thrown out. Is that right? Yeah. Sounds great to me. Sweating. <laughs> okay. Very well. It, 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 seemed, it seems bizarre that they're even, that they're having, I suppose if Andrew Bridgen hadn't done this, they wouldn't be debating in Parliament. Like Andrew Bridgen is like the mechanism to mm -hmm. it. But the language around trans rights, around LGBT, LGBT rights in general, is to my mind becoming more and more regressive. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming quite more dangerous. Well, oh, that's like, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say that that key line, that gen uh, mutilation, genital yeah. mutilation. That, that's the sort of language he was Aye. using yesterday, and it's so out of whack mm -hmm. with what we're actually talking about here. But it's also see when he's talking about like, uh, and and to be fair, the Tory party and the Prime Minister seem to also support this idea that parents should always be informed, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what the child wants about any, as you say, any questions that they have or anything. Can you imagine if one of Lawrence Fox's wings are trans? This is a guy putting videos of, videos of himself burning the pride flag. Mm. Like, do you think that wings in a safe home? Mm. If you have just decided, I know, but the parents should know. Some parents are idiots. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. When it comes to this stuff, there's, there's no getting around that. And ultimately it's got to be about, if you're serious about keeping wings safe, then you need to listen to the experts. and for the last hundred years, but even just the last 20 years, we've come on leaps and bounds with recognising just accept people when they tell you who they are. Mm. Like, that's it. Be supportive. In fairness to him, we can't confirm or deny whether the children are in his house. <laughs> well, or, we don't or know. Or he sees them. So. Yeah, we don't <laughs> know. <true. laughs> well, I mean, were you in the chamber for that yesterday or did you did you see bits of it? No, no, I've I seen clips of it, but... Uh, like, but Parliament's had a lot of these sort of bills over mm. the last few years coming through our Westminster Hall debates on, you know, it, it, it's all the usual dog whistles, you know, that were perverts and pedos and grooming children and all the rest of it. And, like, it, it always amazes me, particularly the likes of Andrew uh, Bridgeton when they say they're anti-woke. Because what does woke mean? <laughs> to me, woke means being sound, yeah. like mm. being a nice person, trying actively trying not to be an arsehole. That's what woke means. Like, why would you be anti-woke? Mm. I don't understand how that's a, like, a credible basis for any kind of political movement. Like, Does it worry you, that kind of language sort of bleeding into the chamber? Because yeah. that is like oh, totally. parliamentary yeah. time. Oh, it's terrifying. That. Terrifying. And I mean, as a lesbian myself, obviously I'm... It, it hits closer to home than it does other folk. And certainly I, I, I feel like I've been, you know, sounding the alarm, the warning alarms for at least since 2016 because I've seen this stuff coming. It, it, you ask anybody in the queer community, we've seen this coming down the line and it is slowly, bit by bit, our worst fears are coming true because suddenly you've got newspaper articles, all the rest of it, like, inundated with articles about trans people and you know the, the the trans movement and all the rest of it and how aggressive it is and such like and it's nonsense it's absolute nonsense and at no point do they ever ask a trans person like it, it, it upsets me so much that we talk about trans people in such a politicized way and we don't even invite them to be part of the conversation like that in itself is the problem you have to listen to folk when they're telling you what their experience is. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's definitely getting worse and it's scary, mm. definitely. How does it make you feel then when members of your own party are mm. anti-trans? Oh yeah, no, it's uh, horrifying. I, I really struggle with it. Um, you know, but uh, ultimately people are responsible for their own views and for what they say. Um, but I, I've been, like put it this way, I, I'm very proud of the fact that when we get elected, the SNP had so many gays in it. <laughs> like, <laughs> we made Parliament, one of the gayest Parliament, I think the gayest Parliament <laughs> in the world. And out of all my queer colleagues, like 99% of them are nothing but supportive. Is that is that us? Is that BMQ's reacted to? Yeah, yeah, good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. No, cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Till next time.